We knew coming into this spring campaign that our goals were ambitious. Raising $75,000 is not easy. But this increased amount will help us cover increased costs as we close out our fiscal year on June 30th. We've made great progress, but it's time to roll up our sleeves. As soon as we hit the 75 k mark, we'll end this campaign. If you have given recently, we thank you. If you've ever considered supporting Working Preacher but haven't, now is your time to step up. Take a moment, think about all of the ways that Working Preacher has accompanied you in your ministry and know that your gift of any size makes an enormous difference. In the last 12 months, we've surpassed the 5 million user mark for the first time. Amazing. This is all made possible by your generosity. Go to workingpreacher.org slash donate to make your gift today and thank you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. The third Sunday after Pentecost falls on June 9th, 2024. And the texts are these, Genesis 3, 8 through 15. If you are following the semi-continuous reading cycle, however, it's 1 Samuel 8. I'm going to say selected verses. Psalm 130. 2 Corinthians 4, 13 to 5, 1, and Mark 3, 20 through 35. Great story from Mark. Hmm. Disturbing story from Mark. Disturbing story from Mark. Disturbing story from, disturbing Mark. Story from Mark. You just like to say Beelzy Bowl, I bet. Uh, how do you say it? Beelzy Bowl. Beelzy Bowl? Beelzy Now you grew up me. I always say Beelzebub. Beelzebub. Beelzebub? Beelzebub. Yeah. Do you know what it means? There's a bowl here. Do you know what it means? Build a bulb. <laughs> Build a bear. No on, there's no B on the end of bulb. Build a bear. You're right. Beelzebub. Beelzebub. Do you know what it means? Beelzebub. Beelzebub. I know what it means. Okay. What does it mean? It's a great name. It means it means Lord of the Dung Heap. Ooh, it <laughs> is a great name. <laughs> Told you it was a bulb. You are Lord of the Dung Heap. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 All right. Anyway, why do you like the story so much? Besides the fact of Beelzy Bull. <laughs> Beel- uh, well, it's uh, it's it's Beel- it's Mark and intercalation, you know, so you've got two stories here, the sandwich Ooh, method. A story right. begins, another story intervenes, and then the yes. beautiful story resumes, Mark which Lowe. is an invitation to read them together. Mm-hmm. So you've got Jesus' family, people who presumably know him well, and they come to seize him. (laughs) And the reason they seize him is a matter of interpretive dispute. And then you've got the scribes from Jerusalem who are all of a sudden, we have escalated from the local Pharisees to now the scribes from Jerusalem. You've got temple officials, you've got Sadducean big boys, so to speak. These are highly credentialed legal experts who have taken a trip to Galilee to check out this new preacher. And their response to him is, yeah, he's powerful, but he's harnessing satanic power to do what he does. You've got two groups who have significant authority and should have significant insight into who Jesus is or the things that he is about. And one judges him satanic and his family appears to be the group of people that thinks he's lost his mind. It's the, the translation there is should be they, right, uh, in verse 21. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for they were saying he has gone out of his mind. Mm-hmm. It's not people. And so there's a question of what the antecedent to they is. Mm-hmm. And the most obvious thing in the, in the syntax here would be his family, which is striking, right? That his family thinks, what's happened to Jesus? Mm-hmm. Um, people don't like that reading because it doesn't square well with Mark or, or I'm sorry, with Matthew or Luke. Uh, it, it's disturbing. Uh, but so is what Jesus says after that, which is, you want to know who my family is? It's you folks. Mm-hmm. You're in the house around me. Mm-hmm. The implication to that, I think, is it's it's not them anymore. And, okay. and, well, and then there's the definition in verse 35 of, well, then whoever does the will of God is my um, brother and sister and mother. And, yeah. oh, go ahead. 
No, no, I'm just, I was, I was vocally agreeing. Oh, yes. And which then, of course, raises the question of what just exactly is the will of God. Uh, and so that, you know, how, how then that, how then that gets unpacked and interpreted. But yeah, that redefinition of, of family. I do think that, uh, but, it, we you know we can we can come back to the you know the, the situation that's presented in Mark, but I do think though that a lot of listeners will resonate with this um, in terms of where family strife has occurred because of religious convictions and religious loyalties and obediences. Um, and I, 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 I wonder, I, I, I don't, that's a pastoral place for me. I wonder how some of this might land, um, particularly in, in the States when, when tensions are heating up with our presidential election and the way in which that, uh, that election before already caused uh, family division. So I, 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 I just put that out there. We, as a kind of a side, a, a side reality that I think, I think this could land on years that would be, wow, <laughs> I get that. Um, maybe they weren't called Beelzy Bowl, but you know, other well, they things. Called other names. <laughs> You were called other names. Yeah. And some of them were just as um, hurtful. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I think one of the things that might be worth um, holding up um, and, and you guys, you guys can tell me if this, this makes any sense. Um, we know the ending of Mark has that rough ending where um the first ending says the women went away and they kept their mouth shut because they were scared. And then we have that added ending. And then, of course, we have all these stories uh, from the other Gospels that record that obviously somebody said something because we're still 2,000 years later talking about the rumors of the resurrection. Um, I think the same thing might be true in reading Mark here um, is um, a reminder that not getting Jesus, anybody, whether you're a religious leader, whether you're a Pharisee, whether you're a scribe, whether you're his own family, is not the end. It's a journey. And are we patient with one another, um, especially if we think we've found the answer? Uh, I, I sometimes have noticed that adult converts are, are harder to deal with because uh, they forget that, you know, they were 45 before they said, oh, yes, Jesus, and they want everybody to be there. And it's like, look, it took you 45 years. You know, maybe it's going to take them 46. Give them a break, you know. Um, but the, the, one of the things that I think about is um, uh, the book um, that uh, was called You Lost Me. Um, um, and I can't remember... I can't remember the author's name right, uh, right now, but it was uh, a uh, survey that was done of, uh, I think, uh, young adults that were like maybe 20 to 35 or something like that, uh, who were raised in the church. And it was asked, what's your opinion of the church? And their responses led to, you know, I grew up in this and you lost me. I, it, I don't get it. But one of the comments that was made that really struck out for me was this young person who said, you lost me today doesn't mean you've lost me forever. And they were, they were genuinely saying, I, I don't know if I can handle this Christian stuff right now based on my experience, what I'm exposed to, what I'm reading, what I don't get, but don't write me off. Mm -hmm. And, and I, 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 in your pastoral uh, caution to us, Caroline, I would invite pastors to offer that. Um, don't let where you are right now cause you to write off people who aren't where you are. 
rather extend to them the grace that got you to where you are, because maybe all of you will come to a different point as you continue continue to encounter Jesus. Yeah, what both of you have said makes me think about verses 28 and 29, the, the unforgivable sin, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, mm. which is a passage that's never really bothered me. And But every time I teach <laughs> Mark, <laughs> somebody's like, you have to explain this to me right now. And exactly. Uh, like, are you, are you worried you did it? You know, or what, you know, it's a bit, yeah. we're shocked when Jesus describes something as an unforgivable sin. And I think Cliff Black explains it really well and better than I usually do. But, but it gets to that question of how do we know when somebody's too far gone? Or how do we know when somebody is, has kind of blunted their religious sensibilities or had them blunted by others to the point where you just can't, and the answer, of course, is I think you never know, but we're living in a time where people want to make those decisions. Attrition in churches does really weird things to people. It's been doing that since the third century in terms of trying to explain why people leave. And like you said, Caroline, in the middle of this election, people are saying stuff like, you know, this is a battle of good versus evil. And mm -hmm. everybody who says that, I'm like, yeah, but I'm on the evil side. So, I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. you know, how how that rhetoric is just so toxic. And when the church picks it up yep. and imitates it, or when the church gives a religious validation to it, like, yeah, there's just a point where some <laughs> congregation by congregation, we've got to reclaim a way of speaking that avoids falling into that. At the same time, I've got really strong opinions about what's right and what's wrong and where I want things to go. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But I, I get just sickened when we bring this apocalyptic kind of theological language into some of that discourse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of people who have lost friends, family, jobs over this in recent years. And mm, maybe, again, going back to last week's reentry into Mark, where we're remind uh, we're we're not just reminded, we are told blatantly <laughs> of the conflict and the rejection or the, you know, that they, that the reaction to Jesus, and he hasn't really done that much yet, you know, mm -hmm. we're only in chapter two, <laughs> is to destroy him. And, and then that a sermon here, I mean, and then, and that even that resistance or rejection is as close as his family. Um, maybe it's not the place to, um, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm struggling. I, I struggle with this text to kind of squeeze out some good news here. <laughs> uh, and I guess not that you have to always, but I, but, or, or maybe, uh, and I think, uh, you know, our preachers, pe preachers can figure that out, but I do wonder if it's a, if it is a space to sit in some of that conflict for a while and, or sit in that space of the reality of what happens when, what happens when you choose to do the will of God what, and how you define the will of God and when you choose to follow Jesus and stand up for, uh, for righteousness and justice and, and what the resistances were going to be. Um, I, I don't know. That's kind of where I'm leaning. Like just that's where the, that's where maybe some of the space needs to be for a sermon like this. That space is a space that, if we want to be like God, being like Jesus is, is extending that patience that, you know, Jesus doesn't shut, even, even though his words are, are clear, you know, we think, um, he doesn't shut anybody out. Mm -hmm. and the, the, the parable nature of his responses causes people to have to think. Is he talking about me? Am I, you know, Matt, you were saying, am I, which side am I aligning up with? Um, just the fact that we're still asking the question is an invitation to lean in 
And what we see, what we're describing, what we see so much in our culture is a demand that you get out. And what does it mean for us to say, I want to do this in a way that causes, that invites you to lean in, even when you're disagreeing with me, because we haven't got to the end of the journey yet. So walk with me a few more paces. And and maybe I need to, you know, maybe I need to lower my tone or maybe I need to slow down my rhetoric to give you a chance to ponder a little bit more and me a chance to listen because maybe both of us have something to learn here. And Cliff Black does get to that. I mean, we have to go on, but Cliff Black does, I mean, he does like, I will say though that, you know, let's give Jesus mother, and this is what you're saying, right? Brothers mm-hmm. in Jerusalem, scribes of benefit of the doubt, they all may have wanted more than anything else to do God's will. So may we in pew and pulpit. Exactly. Uh, and so, um, yeah. And the trap is ever before us is to define the kingdom's boundaries and expect God to abide by our beliefs. So by our beliefs. Well, and maybe this is a good time since we're, you know, at the beginning of a long series through Mark uh, yeah. for preachers to remind their congregations, if you're looking to Mark waiting to find religious insiders who are going to give you confidence, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a really disappointing book for you. So you've got to figure out who shows faith, when, where, why, and how. There'll be a couple of those coming up in the next couple of weeks. But the people who are supposed to get it just don't. And so which then throws you back on, is this Jesus merciful or not? He's certainly powerful. Verse 27, mm-hmm. got mm-hmm. powerful good news. But is he merciful or not? Which, like you said, Joy, throws us back on that ending. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah. What's going to happen? Will Jesus meet them in Galilee like he promised? All right, we should go on. Or you okay. could just preach on Genesis 3, 8 to 15. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I always like to say when when I start here is I know we um, we sing um, uh, the old hymn I come to the garden alone um, when we do the resurrection story, but uh, I want to sing that here. <laughs> it's a very different garden. <laughs> it's a very different garden. It's a very different idea of what it means that God is walking in the garden with us. Um. And and I think um, I think it might I, I I personally like to think of that song here, um, uh, kind of in light of what we've just talked about in terms of Mark, the patience of God, even when we and turn our it, Is that how it relates to Mark? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> I don't know if I want to. I don't want know if I want you to blame me for that connection. <laughs> I just have in my notes odd choice next to this. <laughs> That's I. I had similar terminology uh, <laughs> of what that means. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you. Uh, yeah. I, I. I have yet to find a connection. Not that you have to, but um, you just can preach it on its own. I figured it was a way to describe who the strong man is. That the, the Beelzebul, and this is if this is the origin of Satan. Uh-oh. That's good. The of the enmity between the demonic and humans. Hmm. Ascribe hmm. to Matt that connection. There you go. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> or it could be a definition of the will of God. Oh. Maybe. Um. I don't know. Or it could be or a reminder that even the people that are supposed to get it don't. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it could just be the woman whom you gave me. She gave me the fruit and, the, and I ate. And it could be about your family will always betray you. <laughs> <laughs> or as one of my students said, you just can't trust a woman. I couldn't believe he said that. And he almost got, I mean, the other women, the women in the class were like ready to stone him. <laughs> the students said this like. In like class. Without, without irony. <laughs> without irony, as we read this text. What does it mean to you? You can't trust a woman. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Gosh. You want to see me after class? Yeah. I didn't have to. Like I said, the other students jumped in. <laughs> <That's for sure. sighs> Do you have anything else to say about Genesis 3? You know, um, you know, this 
again, it's the God who is with us even when we walk out on God's story, the God who uh, finds us when we try to hide in um, the neighborhood that God created. Um, It's uh, the God who asked us when God already knows what we've done. And Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's this opening narrative, like you said, Matt, that helps us understand just how big this divide is going to be. And the division between our relationship um, with God is going to show up in divisive relationships that are most intimate to us. Yeah, I think I like that. And I think too, it, it, for me, and if I were going to preach this, I th- maybe not not in connection to Mark, but it's that it's that reality of uh, it, it's I don't know it, it that first that first verse they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden uh, because you know because they know what they've done and and then they have to face God. And I, I, you know, and that goes back to perhaps the will of God. I mean, when do you know you're doing the will of God? And when do you know you have gone against it? I mean, there's something, there could be something there too that, or, yeah, when do you hide behind the trees? <laughs> or, or maybe um, rather than spending so much time asking the question, have I, have I, have I? paying attention to the places where you know I need to hide here. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. We can, we, can, we, can avoid, we can avoid the clarity by paying attention to the hypothetical. Right. I should be hiding here. Yeah. This, yeah. Is, this would be a time for hiding. <laughs> it's just, yeah. I'm just going to go behind this little tree up here. If, if, uh, <laughs> if I can make a connection... Uh, this just I, this just popped out for me. So this is going against with uh, uh, Black's um, um, commentary uh, in terms of um, the serpent and the the um, 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 uh, attributing what what is the unpardonable sin to attribute uh, uh, evil to to Christ. Um, this is a stretch, but if God has put enmity. Um, between um, the um, between the serpent and the offspring, and he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel, and that becomes the descendant of woman, Jesus, who strikes to not keep that separation. That enmity would be unforgivable. Because it's going against the very thing that God has said. I'm putting a division between the two. And so for you to say that Jesus is ev- the evil one, I mean, that's, mm. I don't know, that, that may be too much of a stretch. Can I tell you what I would do with the psalm and then we can go to yes. First Samuel? Fix this. I think that, you know, we tend to... At least this is my this is often my interpretation of Psalm one thirty. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice, let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. That it that that out of the depths is uh, a place of deep despair or deep mm-hmm. sadness mm-hmm. Uh, or 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 you know, separation or suffering or hurt or all of those things. But I wonder if it could also be um, out of the depths of my disobedience, right? Um, you know, out of the depths of my absolute separation from you, which was in part my doing, <laughs> or maybe all of my doing. Mm-hmm. Lord, hear my voice um, and the voice of my supplications. I don't know. That's that's one thing I think of with the psalm based on what we talked about already. I, that kind of goes along with the note I made. Um, I, I just wrote, uh, in the context of the readings today, this becomes a prayer of hope 
and anticipation. Guilty as we are, God is good. Anyway, you can come back to the psalm, but you should probably go to... Sure. I misread First Samuel. I said it was all chapter 8 selected verses. I forgot you can also do chapter 11, 14 to 15. So, oh, um, phew. Samuel, Samuel was called as a boy last week. Now he's old. And his <laughs> sons don't follow in this his is way. a soap opera, man. He grew up in two episodes. <laughs> I know. And then chapter 11, they're going to anoint Saul. So, or at least uh, make, they're going to make Saul king in Gilgal. So, a lot's going to be going on here in a bit of a hurry. Um, Samuel does pretty well for himself. He becomes a judge. He's kind of a priest as well. He's got power. So when, when people say we want a king and Samuel's got this nice pious response to that, Samuel also realizes a king means he's going to lose power. So there's some, there's a little Mm -hmm. bit more going on behind the scenes as well, which is uh, Mm -hmm. interesting as they say in Minnesota. But, um, yeah, here's the introduction to kingship. And, And God calls him out on that. Samuel, this isn't about you. They haven't rejected you. Yeah. And, and it, I just don't want there to be a king. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if, if I may, um, particularly because this is an election year, what it is that kings do, what it is that God warns God's people when they say, we want a leader like everybody else. We want to be governed by a person like ourselves because everybody else is governed by a person from their tribe. And the warning is that what this leader is going to do is to make you their chauffeurs of the privilege and warriors against those they assign as your enemies. What this king is going to do is to assign your servants, uh, to assign the role of servants to your daughters. That role will be for their pleasure without regard for your daughter's capacity to be human. Uh, They're going to take your land. They're going to take your labor. They're going to even take your luxuries and gentrify them for their own insider's gain. He's going to take your employees. He's going to take your equipment. He's going to assign a portion of even what remains to his institutions at the demise of yours. And by the time you realize that, by the time you realize that you've lost everything, you will have no relationship with the God who is warning you that this is your future. I, 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 I find that a compelling word, no matter what um, political um, alignment you, you put yourself, because this is what the leaders like everybody else has does. And God warned ancient Israel and it might do us to read this as a living word today. Yeah, talk about a passage where uh, it's hard to find good news. Which you no, mentioned earlier, no, Carolyn, no. The gospel text. Yeah. Uh, you've got this one. And this gets lived out in David and in Solomon and many yep. of the uh, following kings of Israel and Judah. All of them. Be careful what you wish for. Be careful. <laughs> be careful with God saying yes to what you beg for. And this is one of the challenges, I think, with this, uh, with the uh, this isn't working for me cycle of yes. year B, is that a lot of stories mm-hmm. leave a preacher really bereft of opportunities to find good news in the story mm-hmm. without mm-hmm. it becoming like, and this is why Jesus came to fix everything or something oh, like that. Yeah. You know? but, yeah. So uh, yeah. don't don't play that card unless you absolutely have to if you're trapped in a corner, but. Um, to, you know, to try to find ways of talking about God's forbearance, mm-hmm. trying to find uh, little people. By little people, I just mean people who don't get a lot of ink in the narrative and try to find where their faithfulness is highlighted, even if it gets taken advantage of. Um, mm-hmm. 
yeah, there's a there's a bare knuckleness to this part of the of the Bible and a real politic to this part of the Bible that um, requires, I think, a lot of your creativity as a preacher to find ways of um, speaking positively about God and finding examples of that in the text. And in the midst of the calamity and division that we currently live in, maybe the truthfulness that there is a point when God says enough might be the goodness of God. Just, you know, you've heard me say this before, just think of that harm that was done for you that makes it where you say, I don't think I can forgive this. I know I can't forget it. Or that uh, idea or ideology that is so unjust, 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 um, that God sees that too. And there is a point when God says, enough. Second Corinthians? Yeah, we should say a couple things on that, shouldn't we? Yes. <laughs> I'm just going to jump to, so we don't lose heart. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about that when we were talking. I'm like, let's go to Second Corinthians. Let's go to Second Corinthians and just yes. like do those words and bye. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. yeah. we've established that 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 uh, where ancient Corinth was for Paul in second Corinthians is a place of suffering is a place of division is a place of what, what's your line? Uh, we're in the, uh, this isn't working for me. <laughs> and yet oh, the for, text yeah. says, <laughs> Hey y'all, this isn't really working for me. See, I can't right. say y'all. Yeah, this isn't. Yeah. And, and, and yet in this, the text says, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. Well, and to help people see that in Paul, that he's, and he'll have more to say in this letter about his own sufferings. And in part, he's trying to defend himself against charges from people in Corinth that he's not charismatic enough, that he doesn't show enough power and spirituality. And Paul kind of comes off looking like a little bit of a, a little bit of a masochist, right? And in terms of talking about how his sufferings are where you see Christ and the, the hermeneutical key there, I think is to make sure people know Paul, Paul quite literally, I think sees himself as participating in Christ by participating means he is unified in Christ with death and resurrection. And Paul sees his own body as a place where the gospel is being reenacted, so to speak. And that can be, in some circumstances, that can be taken as really perverse and a kind of weird love of suffering. Mm. I don't think we can psychoanalyze Paul and accuse him of that. But I think for Paul, he's come to the point where he realizes that his life is so cross-centered, so cross-imbued, that this narrative of Christ's suffering and obedience and and discovering power to jump to first Corinthians one through the cross is something that's not just something that we, that we confess in church. I believe this, but Paul says it's, it's in my flesh. It's in my experience. Mm -hmm. It's in who I am. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to replicate that for myself. I'm probably too afraid to, mm -hmm. but I want to make sure I respect it when somebody else is able to get to that depth of spirituality <laughs> And we get a hint of that here. I think really makes Paul, you don't have to like Paul, but if you don't think he's interesting, you're not reading him right.